So the lesson on spiritual warfare, how was your week? I'm sure there are stories to tell. Um, we have kind of gone through now chapters one through nine, and we ended last week with Paul teaching the believers about giving. Well, in the first word of chapter 10, you, you see the word now. So this kind of tells us that now Paul is starting to shift gears. And in the next couple of um, chapters, we'll see him do just that. Some people had, the, uh, some theologians had thought that maybe this was even a different letter because he shifts gears, but it's not, it's the same. But he's just telling us now, I, that stuff has gone before, now I want you to hear me on these things, and that's what he's going. So as I was um, studying, I was in my room, my grandson Holland was there, and I always get great illustrations when the grandkids are around. But he's there, and I'm up in my room and studying, and he, and he runs in, because what he did was behind my chair, he hid a stash for the time he was here at my house. He had a little stash. He had bubble gum back there. He had my cough drops, which he thought were candy. And so during the day, he would just like go into his little secret place and grab his stash. So he comes in, and he says, Nani, what are you studying? And I said, oh. I am studying about battles and about wars and about fortresses. And he's like, you are? And I said, yes, I am. He's like, I know how to fight bad guys. And he starts doing his best ninja moves. Like He's like, ah, yeah. And he's kicking and he's screaming. And I just had to giggle because I thought, isn't that how the Lord sees us? I'm looking down at him. He's like three feet tall. And I'm like, you're not that fierce of an opponent, Holland. <laughs> like, yeah, but he, and I think he was in like his, his undies. <laughs> so he's like doing his ninja moves in his undies. And I just thought, okay, you're not that fierce. He's kicking, he's fighting, he's screaming. And I just thought that's how the Lord sees us because we try to fight in his flesh. And I thought, you know, if someone would just come in and just give him a good shove, it would knock him into the wall. And he would quickly turn from what he thought was a fierce opponent into just a, an enemy. Like he would just fall into a puddle. He would be hurt. He would be crying. He would be defeated like that because his flesh has no strength even though he thought that it did. And that's kind of the big idea of our lesson here today that we're going to see our spirit is willing but our flesh is very weak. Maturity is achieved when a person postpones immediate pleasures for the long-term values. And we're gonna see that Paul, even though he's dealing with opposition, even though that the people are saying, you know what, you're bold in your letters, Paul, but you're kind of weak when you get here. Your speeches, they're worthless. What they're saying is, you know, as far as what we think a guy preaching the word should be, you're not it. Like, you're not the dynamic speaker that we thought you were. And we're, they're basing everything on their appearance. And so they're still kind of struggling with some of these immature thoughts and these immature behaviors. And the next few chapters, we see what we think is maybe him defending his ministry. But I think if we take a closer look, I think what we're going to see is Paul has a much deeper work that he wants to do through these believers. He wants their maturity to grow in Christ. And he uses this chapter to do it. Now, this is a group, they're still fighting in that flesh. They're still fighting like that little kid. They're still looking at appearances. They're still battling his authority over them. Some, some are starting to get it, aren't they? But some are still immature. A godly leader knows the way, he goes the way, and he shows the way. And that's what we're going to see Paul doing. Now, he's saying to them, whether I write you letters or whether I'm with you in the person, you can count on this one thing. I give you the truth. I tell you the truth. I will continue to tell you the truth. It, he's consistent throughout his ministry that no matter what goes on, and people are going to try and sway us from the doctrine of the truth. People are gonna try and get us, and that's what these few pockets of false teachers were doing, trying to get them swayed off the truth. And Paul's saying, you can count on this. It's not of my flesh. I'm gonna give you Jesus, and I'm gonna give you the truth. And I'm gonna give you that spiritual truth always. 
Paul's using the circumstances that he finds himself in, just doing life with the people around. He finds himself giving them and leading them through those circumstances, and he's going to teach them the truth. Isn't that true discipleship? Isn't that authentic leadership? What he's showing us in these verses is the way that an authentic leader leads his people. Paul is saying that um, he wants their maturity in Christ, not in word. He's not begging them for maturity. He's not demanding maturity. He's just showing them mature things through their lives. Do you know what another word for maturity is? To ripen. To ripen. He wants, Paul wants to ripen them for the work of the ministry. Among other things that we're going to see, we get to see this leader working to mature his followers. Now, um, he's about to teach some pretty mature concepts here, isn't he? He's going to go into um, spiritual warfare, and he's going to go into spiritual authority, and he's going to go into measuring of a ministry, which we all have studied within our um, stud- homework this week, but he's going beyond presenting the gospel because he says in the text, I already brought you the gospel. I was the one that shared the good news with you. So we're beyond the elementary things of eternal life that we're going to go on now to ripen you, to ripen you in these things. And simultaneously, Paul does three things during this text. Some are very obvious, and then some you kind of have to dig a little. One, he starts (laughs) teaching them weightier doctrines. So he's teaching them weightier doctrines. He's going to get into spiritual warfare, which is a weighty doctrine for us to understand. He also is going to teach them about leadership, that there are, there's an order to what God does. There's a spiritual authority. God's placed spiritual authorities in our lives, and we're going to see what that brings us. And then he does it by being an example. He's the one. He's going to go the way, and he's going to show the way. He's going to be an example to them. Paul has a heart for his believers. He has a heart for his followers. And isn't that the heart of every good leader? That they would have a heart for those that would be transformed into the image of Christ. That's what our goal is as leaders, is that we would be transformed, and in turn, the followers would be transformed. So let's get into the spiritual warfare aspect. In verses 4 and 5, now he's pleading with them. He tells us in the ver- in verses one through three. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being <coughs> absent, I'm bold towards you. But I beg you that when I am in, uh, that I may not be bold when I'm with you, with the confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, saying that he's going to de- uh, deal with those that are opposing him who think of us as though we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we're human, we do not war against the flesh. And verse 4, for our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments of every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, he says in these verses that it's for it's the mighty works of God, meaning it's powerful. It is the most powerful thing, that it pulls down strongholds and it casts down um, arguments. Turn with me really quick to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at a couple of things in Ephesians chapter 6. We'll start in verse 12. Verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, in order for us to reach spiritual maturity, we must realize that our fight is not flesh and blood. Our fight is not flesh and blood. What is our fight? Our fight are these spiritual enemies. Let me sort of break them down because the goal of these enemies is to knock you from your spiritual standing. 
That's the battle. The battle is to get you off track. The battle is to get you to walk away from God in a time when you need him the most. It says against principalities. That word principalities literally means the beginning, the first person or the origin. We have to realize if we want to reach that spiritual maturity, the battle is over Jesus. It's that battle of good and evil. He goes on to say against powers. That literally is the power of choice, the liberty of doing what one pleases. The liberty of doing what one pleases, the power and the authority of our rights. That's our world system. That's the world wants its way. They're against God and it's continually pulling us Christians away from what the Bible tells us. It's that the world and its systems, it wants us to go with its flow. The rulers of darkness, there's the Lord of this world, the Lord of this age, the devil is roaring around the earth seeking whom he can destroy. And then spiritual wickedness is the human condition. It's our sin. It's our iniquity. So these are the enemies of the cross, not the things that we think through every day. We waste so much time thinking about things that don't really matter. And this is our <laughs> spiritual, another word for warfare is campaign because it's not just one war. It's a campaign. It's our campaign for life, uh, good versus evil, the world, the devil, our own sin. Those are the spiritual enemies. And it's not one with our ninja moves. <laughs> we can yell, we can scream, we can kick. And you know what? The enemy just goes, and then there we go flying in. And you know what? Our flesh wasn't as strong as we thought it was. But Ephesians 6 gives us some great tools to be able to use against our warfare. Um, what are you trying to fight with? Think about what you use in the time of battle. And I would say if we really take a walk with this, we might initially say, oh, well, I, I use the Bible or I walk in the spirit. Really? When you're having an argument with your husband? When you're, when you're talking about another friend? When, you know what I mean? Like you name it, when you're under pressure and stress, are we really walking in the power and the weaponry that God gives us? There are these mighty weapons in Ephesians 6, and it gives us some great instructions. So let's kind of look at those, and it's the armor of God. Now, when we were little, we see the cute little pictures of the armor, right? And... It was cute, and um, this, there's a picture of, this is me teaching about the armor of God. Um, last year, we got the opportunity to go on a missions trip to Ireland, and we went into um, this refugee camp. Now, oddly enough, it was in, they placed these people, they were fleeing Africa to get away from their enemies, and they were placing them in the refuge of a castle in Ireland, and this is the castle they were in. This is where they were living. And it was just room upon room. They were in this mighty fortress. Some of them had been there for five years. They were getting pregnant there. They were having babies there. Well, they can't leave because they're kind of in, they're called asylum seekers. They're in this place. And the kids, you'll see the kids kind of sitting around and <coughs> different churches will come in and different groups will come in to teach these kids. And they're adorable little kids. And then you're hugging them and you see them and they're going like this. And then you're looking and you can see, like literally see the bugs like crawling down their neck. And they're living, they're just, they run all over the place. When people came in to teach, like two and three year olds, they were just, they would just walk in like, where's your parents? Like, I don't know, they're just running around the castle. And, and it's cute and we see that armor and then um, one, particular Sunday, I had gone to church with my grandson, Holland, again, my little warrior, and <laughs> we were checking him into his little three-year-old class, and he was so excited, and they were trying a new church, and we got to the door to check him in. It took us like 15 minutes to check him in. We get to the door, and the teacher goes, oh, there's no teacher here for his class today. You'll have to take him in the sanctuary, and his little face just went like, he started crying. We ended up having to like leave 
And so I went home and I thought, the enemy's not getting my grandson. I'm giving him a Sunday school lesson today. So I grabbed the foil and off we went talking about spiritual warfare. But all those things are fun. And we think about, when we think about the spiritual armor, we think about those things. But we have to think about what they represent. Because that's where the battle's won. It's in what they represent. That's just to serve as a picture. So the application of the armor, most of them are defensive weapons. Defensive meaning they protect us against our spiritual enemies. Truth protects us against our spiritual enemies. Righteousness protects us against our spiritual enemy. The gospel, meaning that foundation where we're anchored to a foundation to where when the winds and the wave come, we have to have that solid foundation. If you're not on your feet, what kind of an opponent are you? You're on your back if you're not on your feet. So you have to be stable on, within the gospel, the shield of faith. Faith is what breaks away. It protects us from the fiery darts of the enemy. Not the shield, faith. Faith protects us. Salvation, the helmet. If you get a blow to the head, you're gone. That helmet of salvation, eternal life, protects us from death. It protects us from that blow to the head. And then the sword, which is the offen offensive weapon, which is the word of God. Offensive meaning literally an aggressive movement. This word, this is the aggressive movement against the enemies that we face in our spiritual battles. And then he says at the end of that, um, while praying and watching, the word, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It says it's powerful. It, it's funny that it's the sword because it says it's sharper than this sword that you have in your hand. It is the sword and it cuts. It says take, uh, there's a quote that says, take God at his word because winning the battle doesn't require physical brawn. It requires spiritual brains. It requires spiritual brains. Paul not only teaches them about spiritual warfare, but he goes on to teach them about spiritual authority. God has placed spiritual authority in each one of our lives. The church has leaders that are called by God and giving authority over you for what? For teaching, encouragement, exhortation, rebuke, training, correction, and protection. There are pastors and shepherds that God has called and placed over our authority for all of those purposes, shepherds that watch over our souls, the elders that are overseers, teachers that teach us the word of God. Why? Like Paul, um, these leaders aren't trying to lord anything over the flock. They're not trying to scare people with their authority. They're trying to mature the church. Paul's trying to mature the church so that they can be used in the kingdom of God. Um, Turn back a little bit to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read from verses 11 to 16. It says, He himself, God himself, gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come again to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. A picture of a beautiful, healthy body of believers, the church. God gave gifts to the church. He gave them apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? To equip, to furnish the body of Christ and the saints. That's me and you for what? For the work of the ministry. Literally, that word means employment or an undertaking, servant, for the ministry to serve the body so that what? 
so that the body can be built up in Christ, edified, and literally grow the body of Christ, meaning broaden the kingdom. That's our job as a church, to broaden the kingdom. And we see that in our, in our text today. We, see, we saw that during our homework, that you guys would go out and build the kingdom so that then we can go out into areas where nobody has heard the gospel. That's what he says. You can't lead anyone else further than you have gone yourself. Is that a true statement? You cannot lead anybody farther than you have gone yourself. Now, I gave you a list, and I'm going to go through it really quickly. I'll run down, but look at the verses, and maybe you could even find more. But in the digging in this chapter, what I saw was a great bunch of characteristics of a godly leader. Paul, by example, gives us some great characteristics. I'll read you um, real quick. We'll go down the list, and you can look at them. I did it in the New Living Translation, so if you look at the New King James and you're like, I don't get it, turn over to the other translation. Number one, they are gentle but bold when necessary. Paul has all these attributes through this thing. He's such a great picture of a leader. Um, They are spiritually mature. They are prepared spiritually. They are protective of doctrine, verse 5. They teach the truth and exhort followers to obey Christ. They leave the 99 and go after the one. Verse 6, he talks about, okay, when you guys are loyal and you've got it, I'm going to go after the others who still are opposing me. Why? Because he has the heart of a shepherd. He doesn't want that anybody should perish. He doesn't want anybody to not know the truth. It probably drives them crazy that they don't know the truth. So he's like, once you guys get it, I've got somebody else to go on to because someone else needs to hear this. Number seven, they are confident in the authority God has given them to use it to build up the saints. Leaders will always have opposers, verse 10. Um, Leaders don't need to compare themselves to others, but they compare themselves to Jesus. Leaders also in verse 12 says, that they want the name of Christ to be high and lifted up, not theirs. I mean, if you want to take a walk with leadership and what's authentic leadership, look at Paul's example here. Number 11, stay in their own lane and they don't get distracted by extra work. They take responsibility for what God has put them in charge over. They don't take credit for somebody else's work. They are kingdom-minded, not club-minded right? We can get club-minded in the body of Christ. Like, hey, it's working. Let's just leave it like this. I don't want it to change. Why would we not want it to change? We want it to blow this world away. We have to have a view of eternity, not of what's working for us today. We have to have a heart for the lost, number 15. Paul had a heart for the lost, and we are, they are only concerned about what God thinks, not about what men think. And man, that one point, if you're in leadership, you better only think about what God thinks because other people think a lot of things about you. (laughs) Um, Some of them probably true. (laughs) But we want to be able to have the the king of kings and the Lord of lords commend what we're doing, not anybody else. Now, why does Paul have such a heart? Well, Paul has a heart to persuade people because Paul was once lost himself. Paul was lost. If you flip to Acts 9 really quick, Paul had his own conversion. Paul was lost, and Paul was also found. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul goes to the road to Damascus, he meets with Jesus, and Jesus changes his life. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Doesn't that sound what he's up against in 2 Corinthians? People saying, saying those same things. This is Paul breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He knows a thing or two about these people. He went to the high priest and asked letters from him in the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found anyone who were of the way, which is of the church, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem, capturing Christians himself. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. A mighty work, a mighty power of God shone from him from heaven. Then he fell on the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why have you persecuted me? And he said, 
Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. When God reveals himself to us, it's hard for us to deny it. He shines a light into our life. He shows us our own depravity. And then we turn and we go, woe is me. Like he just reveals himself to us. And that is exactly what happened to Paul. And that's what he's trying to do these belie- to these believers. He's trying to reveal Jesus to them. And now he's spending his life doing it. Verse 6 says, so trembling and astonished, the Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. He's looking already, Lord, what do you want me to do? You have saved me. You've shown me the light. Lord, I'm, I am trembled at your presence. What can I do for you? That's what a servant says to their master. What can I do for you now that you've shown me the truth? Because he knows the principle of the truth will set you free. And that it's only by the power of God. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by, the hand, by hand and brought him to, into Damascus. And uh, he was three days without sight, and he neither ate, ate nor drank. Now jump down to verse 20 immediately he preached Christ. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues and that he was the son of God. So Paul understands that these believers are in darkness and they need the truth of God for that spiritual awakening. And that's what he's trying to do. He now sees with spiritual eyes. He now knows the power of God to convert people and he knows that it's only God that can convert people. And he understands that our battle is not flesh and blood. Finally, I just want to point out back in 2 Corinthians 10, in chapter, in verse 4. In verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Um, Those mighty weapons, those tools of our campaign are powerful to pull down strongholds in human reasoning. They destroy it. They destroy the false reasoning of this world. A believer walking in the spirit, waging war in the spirit, waging our campaign in the spirit through the power of God. I'll tell you what's not powerful. What's not powerful is our flesh. What's not powerful is churches bringing in the world into the church. What's not powerful is redefining scripture. In our churches, what's not powerful is them teaching falsities from the pulpit. What's not powerful is changing the very definition of marriage. What's not powerful is not preaching sin, but only preaching those things that people want to hear. Why are churches hugely crowded? Sometimes because they get what they want. Their, their ears are being tickled, and they're not being given the truth. But you know what? That has no power in it. It has no power to change a life. The church, me and you, we need to be Christ-following, God-fearing, operating under the influence of the Holy Spirit with holy weapons for a holy war. We're involved in a holy war. And that is what's going to knock down. Nothing else can knock down. We can protest all day long. We can do all these things in the name of Christ, but what's going to do it is changing one person at a time through the truth of God's word. And that will allow us to stand against the enemy. And I love this song that we sang, In Christ Our Solid Rock I'll Stand. And I just want to close with the um, verses of it, and I hope that it becomes our battle cry. It says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. This world is going to change, and it's going to change, and it's going to change. And little by little, I saw, I don't know if you guys saw Rob Bell. Rob Bell um, was El Velvet, Velvet Elvis author. He has a church called Mars Hill in Michigan, and he was on Oprah. He's the one that said that, the, that maybe uh, Mary wasn't a virgin after all. She, he tries to change scripture, and he said on Oprah, the church is this close to accepting um, homosexual marriages, and he was applauding it. He's like, man, the church, we're this close to, for the church to be able to do that. That was appalling to me, and it's not just that sin. There's sin all over the place, but when the church starts walking in the way of the world, like we're in trouble. We're in trouble. We need to stand up and, and be that. It says, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. I love that sentence. We are within the veil of Christ. Um, the, his oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is my hope and stay. He needs to be our hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. We want to be in him throughout our whole lives, our whole campaign. Dressed in his righteousness, faultless, I stand before the throne. That's powerful. There's nothing that I can do to earn what he has done for me. And I can only stand before God by what he's clothed me in. He's covered me with his blood. He's given me his righteousness. He's given me his truth. He's given me his word. That should be our focus. 